Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Very good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dong, and to the Society for Simulation and Healthcare Systems Modeling and Simulation Affinity Group for inviting me to give this webinar today. I will be using this presentation to show the power of computational modeling in our society and, and how it can be used to transform research in healthcare delivery. I'll describe some of the various initiatives that um, are currently in the community and to describe some funding opportunities and I'll end this talk with some examples of funded research from my program. So the disclosure is the views and opinions which I will be expressing in this presentation are purely my own and not representative of the society and its affiliated groups. So the first statement I'd like to make is that computational modeling is a tool or platform that is severely underused to study complex biological systems. Models, in fact, are used everywhere in our society. Uh, we don't get on a plane without having it modeled. We have modeled trains as well as constructing our uh, buildings. We model the biomechanics of sports movements. We have models that model the packaging of our household um, packages. And in fact, just today, you may have seen this Nature article and news uh, just today, March 9, 2016, that the, the Google Go um, computer uh, was, was able to beat the top ranking professional Go player um, and defeat the, uh, this person. So uh, according to a commentator, the AlphaGo computer played like a human professional, but with the emotional elements carved out. So imagine that. So models are used everywhere, uh, perhaps except for in our own clinics, when we go visit our doctors to understand what's going on with our bodies and our health. Um, and that is what I'm going to be talking about today. So why should we do modeling? Modeling complements experiments. It helps us interpret data. It allows us to conduct quantitative parametric studies, provide an alternative platform for understanding a complex disease or problem or health delivery system, and it provides a non-invasive and cost-effective way to study these systems. Again, these modeling provides not only those things, but an infrastructure for systematically archiving and transferring knowledge um, by modeling, by events, the reinventing It is one of the only ways to predict outcomes not otherwise testable. And it's a way to drive scientific discovery, in a sense, turning biology into a science. Um, modeling allows us to extend insight and understanding beyond the cognitive capabilities of the human mind. So in this review article by Ray Winslow in 2012, he nicely explains physiological function as distributed across multiple biological scales. And he states that understanding physiological systems in health and disease can only be achieved through quantitative modeling, and that cannot be understood using mental models. In the same paper, he describes the different mathematical models that can be used across the different scales of the human body. And within this plot, you see that there are now many types of measurement techniques that can be used to collect the data at these scales. So our uh, environment is primed for modeling, but acceptance is needed, not only by scientists who will use the models, the end users, which we are developing the models for, but by other modelers. And in fact, modelers are the, probably the greatest skeptics of, of each other. Um, so the, the idea is to promote a user-centered model design, which will increase reproducibility and reusability of models. But modeling acceptance is quite challenging. Challenges are the presumption that many biological systems are too complex to be modeled accurately. Um, perhaps 
there's an incomplete understanding or misconception regarding the computational model itself, and there's a lack of communication between modelers and experimentalists. And the inertia that must be overcome in order to embrace the computational modeling can be extremely high. So Gary Ahn wrote a paper in 2010 that talks about that in the past we had this iterative loop of the scientific process in which data is produced either by observation or experiment and these data are then analyzed to detect relationship through correlative methods. These methods then form mechanistic hypotheses from human interpretation, and these hypotheses are then subjected to an experimented and evaluated statistically to enable the trust of the causality represented within the hypothesis. So this is the scientific process. Now in the present, we now have high throughput data collection that has vastly increased the number, of the amount of existing data. So the idea is that the data of these high throughput methods are then processed through sophisticated correlation methods that substitute for human insight, creating a large number of candidate hypotheses which form a bottleneck for um, the process at the point of evaluating the causality. These causality uh, inferences cannot be tested sufficiently using traditional methods. So he proposes to use high performance computing to address this bottleneck issues in which data mining and correlation identification techniques can lead to candidate hypotheses um, with parallel testing of these candidate uh, plausible models are kept and non-plausible models are discarded. At the same time, the high performance computing environment can then for example, construct modular subsystems or multi-scale models of the, of the biomedical systems um, for uh, instantiation of these models. This research then produces the models that the community can use in a knowledge environment, which then go and form the iterative loop of understanding and providing a community knowledge landscape. So how do, we, how do we achieve this goal? So currently we have several initiatives. I will discuss um, the Interagency Modeling and Analysis Group and its multi-scale modeling consortium. I'll talk about the European activities with the Virtual Physiological Human and the Aventena Alliance, as well as the United States activity on the Medical Device Innovation Consortium. So IMAG is a forum of close to 100 program directors uh, from 10 agencies in the United States government from the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, the FDA, the Department of Energy, NASA, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Defense, and various entities within the Department of Defense, as well as the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Intelligence Agency. And so all of us are program directors who have an interest in promoting the funding of computational models for biomedical, biological, and behavioral systems. IMAG was created in 2003, and our creation resulted in the uh, publication of the very first interagency solicitation for um, the awardees from the solicitation there then formed the Multiscale Modeling Consortium in 2006. 2007, we then released another initiative for predictive models for health and disease. We conducted the IMAG Futures meeting, which uh, resulted in the current initiatives, which was reissued and reissued in 2015 for predictive multi-scale models. And I'll talk more about this particular initiative later on in this talk. So multi-scale modeling was the niche area that IMAG identified back in 2003 as uh, a, an area that needs to be promoted to have researchers look above and below their scale of interest in their study of biomedical systems, biological systems, and behavioral systems, and to understand these biological processes to create a predictive capability for um, understanding all of these 
biological scales all the way up to the population level. So the consortium, as I mentioned, are the awardees of the initiatives that we supported over these years. And it's a way for um, the external research community to communicate with the government community. So IMAG and MSM are closely um, related in this interaction. Um, and by participating in the consortium, you also interact with other multi-scale modeling investigators. And the working groups form the backbone of the consortium. And these work groups have webinars about once a month. And we also have a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, we learn about other multi-scale modeling related activities, such as the Virtual Physiological Human Project, which I'll be talking about shortly, and other resources for modeling. So this is a, the, the current 2016 multi-scale modeling working group. So again, working groups are the back consortium. It is created by the consortium, for the consortium, for the needs of the consortium. So every year, the working groups may evolve a bit. They might, they, they might um, converge or split off, or, or we might bring on new working groups. So the current working groups, as you can see, follow a, a large gamut of uh, from tool development to focusing on specific domain areas. So we have systems biology and biomechanics, theoretical computational methods. We have a working group on model and data sharing, high performance computing, clinical and translational issues, computational neuroscience, population modeling, cell to macro scale, integrated multi-scale biomaterials, experimental modeling. And the credible practice uh, working group is actually a very interesting working group, which includes both IMAG and MSM members. And a lot of the guidelines from this working group has now been inserted into the current initiative uh, funding opportunity for multi-scale modeling. So that committee addresses this question that George Box uh, brought out is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. But the question really is how wrong do they have to be not useful. And so that is the question, right? In order to actually have somebody use and reuse your model, what should we, um, how do we make the models cred enough, credible enough for a third party to use it? And so we talk about model sharing and standards, but most of all, how model reproducibility. So in um, 2011, you probably saw this Institute of Medicine uh, uh, National Academies of Science report called Toward Precision Medicine, Building a Knowledge Network for Biomedical Research in a New Taxonomy of Disease. The idea is that they recognize that there is an explosion of disease-relevant data, and we need to better integrate the knowledge from biomedical research with that of clinical medicine. And the idea was that we need a better human disease taxonomy to precisely define and classify diseases. And so in our meeting in 2012, we talked about how we could address this report with multi-scale modeling. And we recognized that multi-scale models can, in fact, integrate the informed mechanistic studies with the observational studies from clinical to really formulate the new practice of clinical medicine through the more modernized disease taxonomy. And this is kind of the thought process that we're having as we move along in the consortium on how do we actually use, develop multi-scale models and use them in a way that can be usable for example, for clinicians to use in the future. So the multi-scale modeling consortium and IMAG really are a, a nice joint advent, venture that is greater than some of its parts. I, I recognize that there are several multi-scale modeling consortium folks on the call, and I'm, I'm glad you joined. You're welcome to chime in and, and express your thoughts as well to this community. And so I think um, IMAG not only benefits from communicating with the consortium, but I think the reverse happens as well. So in um, so the consortium, as I said, meets once a year in person. And we are currently uh, planning our next consortium meeting for later on uh, towards the end of October of this year. Everything is housed on the IMAG Wiki. If you do a search for IMAG Wiki, you'll find um, our consortium. So this next 
I will talk about the virtual hu physiological human effort. Um, and I will want to thank Dr. Adriano Henny for these slides that he's provided. And I see that Adriano, you're on the call. So please chime in as you wish. So um, you uh, asked me to explain um, how some of these initiatives might be connected. And so I see the virtual physiological human really as a sister project to what the multi-scale modeling consortium is doing. Um, the virtual physiological human was a funded effort by the European Commission and I was involved back in 2007-8 in, in talking with the European Commission folks and in formulating some of the collaborative activities between the Europeans and the United States investigators. And it really is to form a methodological and technological framework to enable collaborative investigation of the body to share processes from them and integrate them to better understand the human body as a single system. It's not intended to be a supermodel that will explain all possible aspects of the human physiology or pathology. And, um, and as Adriano explained in his slides, there are 55 European members and five international members, including the United States and a number of personal uh, personnel members and students. So the idea of the Virtual Physiological Human Project really is to bridge the gap to the clinic and, and providing more of a translational effort for modeling from bench to bedside from animal to human to represent dynamic interactions and testable hypotheses, uh, plug and play modules across scales. So I, I do see the, the VPH effort to be a bit more translational than the MSM effort. So I think it nicely leverages the two efforts together. Um, from Adriano's slides, I picked a couple of examples to show you. Um, one of them is the Virtue Heart, which provides a non-invasive assessment of cardiac condition. Um, this model provides um, a, a way to replace complex invasive procedures with patient-specific modeling by measuring the virtual fractional flow reserve emerged from the EU Heart Project. And by the way, part of the funding was also from the United States through other efforts at the NIH. Uh, preliminary testing using this model has been done in 20 patients and now being tested in clinical trials in over 100 patients. So they are implementing the models in the clinical trial uh, arena. Another success story from the VPH is the VPHOP, which models bone fracture in fra fragile elders. Uh, these models predict the risk of bone fracture and osteoporosis, and they have also conducted clinical studies on over uh, 200 patients. Um, and so, again, multi-scale modeling is leading this framework. So I do see that with the VPH, multi-scale modeling has gone further into the clinical arena um, and focuses on translation. So uh, Adriano also provided me slides on the Avantena project, which is, um, I should say, maybe a sister project to the VPH project. It was a strategy for in silico clinical trials, and there was a roadmap activity for the last two years in which they have now a roadmap report from the, the effort. And so this particular effort on Evantena is similar to something I will about to talk about in the United States, and it's to bring together regulators, clinical trial industry, and biomedical industry folks um, to create uh, a, mer a convergence of these sectors, um, having the clinical trial industry folks provide design and execution interpretation of clinical trials, where the virtual prototype industry provides in silico design and assessment. So again, this is a nice balance of the VPH in which this is really engaging the industry efforts uh, in the European Union. Um, and so the use of patient-specific computer modeling and simulation applied in research uh, for new biomedical products. And so the Evanchena includes both clinical and preclinical efforts from physiological-based pharmacokinetics to patient-specific dynamic models, quantitative data, including medical imaging and sensing, and getting a dynamic system view. So the Aventena Alliance was just started this year, and in fact, Adriano led a nice webinar to explain the alliance just 
last week, I believe, and um, and that I, I believe webinar is also posted on their website. And the idea of the alliance is to provide expert advice to the European Commission on drafting um, a consultation in in silico medicine. They're working on inclusion of regulatory acceptance of modeling and simulation data in the medical devices and uh, regulatory efforts. And they're creating partnerships between industry members and members of the vis virtual physiological human effort. And they'll be holding their first global conference in Brussels in October. So um, I'll invite Adriano to chime in at, at any point if, if he'd like to. Um, I believe the next slide is the website where you can find out more information. And I think the the recording of his webinar describing the alliance is posted there. So thank you, Adriano, for your slides. The next deck I, I want to show is actually provided by the MDIC, um, courtesy of Dr. Don Bardot. Uh, the MDIC is the Medical Device Innovation Consortium in the United States. The MDIC was formed in 2012 um, through an effort between the FDA and a memorandum of understanding between the medical device industry in the United States. And the idea is very similar to what I just described for Ev the, the Evangena Alliance, is that the MDIC is promoting um, the medical device discovery development pathway by injecting regulatory science tools and methods um, during the early stage de technology development stage of medical devices. So, you start with basic research, which NSF and NIH funds, going to proof of concept with angel investors and SBIRs. And at this point in which there's early stage technology development, you bring in the regulatory science to help with the further product development and marketing. Again, um, FDA and industry and nonprofits are closely uh, tied together in this triad in which the discussion occurs through uh, multiple projects in the MDIC. The six projects are as follows, clinical trial innovation and reform, um, improving the clinical trial process with increased efficiency and utility through the total product life cycle, application of clinical trial practices, and um, patient-centered benefit risk assessment. So each of these projects are uh, championed by an MDIC board member and, and also an FDA person, and then there's a program manager involved. The latter three projects are case for quality, clinical diagnostics, and of course, computer modeling and simulation. Um, I'm actually involved in the steering committee for this effort, and so have been following their progress over the last few years, which has been very exciting. Um, their effort is to increase confidence in safety and efficacy uh, in reducing the clinical trial size and accelerating device review through regulatory grade computer models and simulations. As I said, Don is a program manager for this effort. And so the just diving deeper into the com computer model and simulation effort of the MDIC, the vision really is to provide quick and predictable access for patients to innovative technologies enabled by modeling and simulation. So it's really putting modeling and simulation at the forefront to increase evaluation confidence, in, increase um, market clearance, accelerate the pace of market clearance, and de decrease cost. Um, and again, the, there's, there's the triad from the board, Randy Scheiss and um, Don Bardot and Kyle Myers from the FDA. And so they've actually accomplished quite a lot. They're, they're in the uh, phase of accepting virtual patient mock submissions to the FDA as a trial to see how these virtual patient statistical frameworks might um, be used, as well as a library infrastructure. And so there's a lot of things going on. Um, the basic idea is to promote um, computational modeling in the regulatory pipeline, and so in the regulatory pipeline, probably about 50% of the submissions of, of discovery and ideas include computational modeling and simulation. But as you go into more of the prototyping phase, you do in, include much more model iteration and design optimization. Um, then as you go into the clinical phase, you have less 
computational modeling, and then as you go into redesign and, and looking at root causes for adverse events, you have more. Um, finally, the, the idea is to use computational models to predict uh, successes and failures and, and helping the regulatory folks make their decisions. So the overall goal, again, of the computational modeling and simulation portion of the MDIC is to use computer models and simulation as evidence for regulatory um, policies, uh, replacing uh, existing bench data with simulation data, reducing the amount of animal studies and number of patients used in clinical trials, uh, reducing the number, the dollar, the the amount of cost for clinical trials and producing better projects, products. Um, they are involved in, again, the model credibility development, archiving data, and producing interoperable models and standards. Um, they are actually at the point of um, developing the virtual patient and virtual devices, even though they projected this to occur much later. Um, so they, they are progressing quite quickly in, in their efforts. So again, many thanks to Don Bardot for providing these slides for me to show you. So again, I see a lot of parallels between the United States and European efforts in which the MSM and the VPH are closely tied and as well the, the Aventena Alliance and the MDIC are also closely tied in, in the types of efforts that, being, that are being conducted. So moving on to the next section of the talk, I will talk about funding opportunities. And just to put some dollar figures on the table, the NIH budget in last year, fiscal year 2015, was about $30 billion, which was spread across 27 institutes and components of the NIH. Each of these components cover a different domain area, uh, disease or condition. My own institute, the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, is this tiny little sliver here that covers technology development. And so um, a lot of the, the, what you see in this pie chart is just how the funds are spread, but we do do a lot of coordination through our institute to allow a lot of inter-institute uh, activities as well as interagency activities. So NIH is more basic science discovery transforming medicine through discovery. So if you look at our triangle pyramid of discovery, we do focus a lot on basic research and technology development, and we go to translational research and ultimately to clinical applications. So if you compare agencies within the United States, um, looking at the National Science Foundation in green, NIH in blue, and DARPA in orange, you can see where the spectrum of support might fall. So in terms of research, um, NIH is much more on um, I, I would say NSF is more on the basic foundations of research. NIH is a little bit towards the applied direction, whereas DARPA can follow the whole spectrum. In terms of risk, um, NIH is probably the most conservative agency um, with less risk, uh, NSF and DARPA being more on the higher risk end. And in terms of entrepreneurial qualifications, um, NIH also leans more heavily on the more experienced investigators and DARPA more on the entrepreneurial investigators. So just to give you on um, how different agencies have different cultures to divide up the, the funding pot of our taxpayer dollars. So I like to show this slide in every single talk I give because a lot of people are surprised that NIH supports non-hypothesis-driven research. In fact, we do. Um, and my institute, if, if actually the project has too much hypothesis, we probably will send it over to another institute. But the idea is that non-hypothesis-driven research really, from our point of view, is a tool-driven revolution to discover new things that have to be explained. And I do see computational modeling as a tool, as a platform. It's not the solution, end-all, be-all, answer to all our questions but it is a tool and platform to help us accelerate our discovery process. So going into the funding opportunity, I will, this is already posted on the streets and many of you may be already familiar with this opportunity. It's our funding opportunity that is ongoing for three years, promoting next generation cutting edge multi-scale models 
thinking out of the box. We have seven participating agencies from IMAG, um, including NIH, um, the Army, the Department of Energy, FDA, NASA, NSF, and the, and the Naval Research Office. Uh, it, within each, there's multiple components, funding, 22 funding components, and we have nine receipt dates. So for those of you not familiar with NIH, you can resubmit and, and um, try again if you don't succeed the first time around. And we have three submission dates a year. Um, and the cooperative agreement part allows investigators to contribute funded efforts to the consortium effort. So if you wonder how the multi-scale modeling consortium operates, it really is the awardees of these um, grants then use their funds to participate in the consortium, travel to the consortium, and, uh, and contribute activities to the consortium. And so the next three slides show some examples of the cutting edge challenges. And really, this comes out of a, a lot of brainstorming with the consortium, with the IMAG Futures meeting that we held. Um, and it really is to promote cutting edge challenges for multi-scale modeling. We, it, it is really a methods initiative more than anything else. Even though we are covering the domain areas of biomedical, biological, behavioral, environmental, clinical systems, the idea really is to promote these methodologies. For example, methodologies that integrate different fields, that integrate different systems, that fuse data rich and data poor scales, Fuse biological and behavioral processes um, to address model poor fields such as tissue engineering, although we have now a growing interest in tissue engineering, computational models, drug and gene delivery, for example, model driven data collection. Um, we do support virtual clinical trials through this activities as well as new novel methods for high performance computing. We strongly incorporate, want models that strongly incorporate uncertainty quantification, as well as a whole slew of bullets that talk about bridging to the population level, capturing clinical and biological realism, uh, developing testable hypotheses for social and behavioral phenomenon, looking at mechanisms below the skin and above the skin, um, looking at characterizations at the different scales above the skin, um, looking at mechanisms for these population level interventions, um, looking at big data, characterizing individual level risk for collective outcomes. So we really, and finally, multi-scale models to improve clinical workflows, standard operating procedures, patient-specific models, a lot of the things that we, I talked about previously uh, in, in terms of increasing patient safety, reducing medical errors, and things like that. So these are really to tantalize the community to think about these cutting edge challenges to, um, to apply for this program. So I just wanted to explain very quickly some of the requirements. Um, you're supposed to have a compelling multi-scale problem identified one, by one of these bullets or some other bullets that I, that, you know, that I didn't mention. It can be for both new and existing models. Uh, Multi-scale models are defined in this initiative as models that cross at least two scales and at least one linkage between scales. We really strive to have mechanistic models which have substantial representations of the underlying biology or behavioral mechanisms. Um, the models should be predictive by the end of the development of the model, so they should have a convincing technical plan for achieving these predictive outcomes. And the data should be identified and appropriately justified at each scale. And, and link modeled. And the architecture should facilitate future model sharing. Now, in terms of the actual requirements that you need to submit, if you don't have these requirements, your proposal will actually be withdrawn from review, is that you have to have a consortium plan. Again, the multi-scale modeling consortium plan is really to provide a funded mandate for people to contribute uh, to the greater good of the community, uh, to provide budget to, actively pursue activities that can be only done within this community environment. So it's really an opportunity to take advantage of using the community to do something that they're passionate about to help the multi-scale modeling community. So the model credibility plan, as I mentioned before, uh, extended from the discussions of the credibility model credibility committee within IMAG and the MSM, and it's really to develop 
to have the applicants develop strategies and methods for evaluating the credibility of the proposed models um, and to address um, how the questions could be of interest within the domain area, the domain area of the users, of the intended users. And so the idea is to have a third party evaluation of the model. This is really the first step in really truly promoting true model sharing, model reusability, model reproducibility. If you cannot get a third party to, to say that they're convinced that their, your model is credible, then it would be impossible for them to even want to use it. Um, the broader impact statement is something where we would like to have uh, an understanding of how this model could contribute to society um, outside of the research realm. And the data management plan is not the data sharing plan, but it's really a description of how the data are uh, managed um, and policies for reusing the data. So now I dive into the more interesting portion. Um, probably the most interesting portion of the talk is some examples from some of our funded investigators. And so as I mentioned, I may not have mentioned, I, I manage the model analysis simulation program at the NIBIB. And in the simulation portion of the program, um, it includes um, the following project from Dr. Suvrano D from RPI, um, in which he is developing a virtual version of uh, the tasks which are part of the fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery, the FLS competency, which must be demonstrated for board certification in surgery. So by having this virtual simulator, uh, they can then implement this type of simulation for all those surgeons um, undergoing the FLS competency test. Dr. Day is also part of the consortium and he's also using other simulator technologies for other application areas. Another uh, project that I want to um, show you is from Dr. Carla Pugh, who is this, this developing a physical model of looking at distributed uh, pressure sensors in a, um, a breast model uh, to look at and define the performance standards in which clinicians actually palpate the breast and using engineering methods to systematically assess performance levels. She's already uh, um, looked at over 600 physicians using this technology and assessing their metrics for um, palpation. Um, this particular project by Dr. Bing Wu from ASU is one of our K99 ROO awardees. For those of you who aren't familiar, this is a pathway to independence award in which the first two years uh, you are finishing up a postdoc and the, and the ROO is used uh, for, your first, um, for, for your first position at, in, in a tenure track position. And so Dr. Wu is developing this haptic uh, visual perception project in which he's using simulation techniques and psychophysical methods to explain how people haptically and visually perceive the mechanical properties of soft tissue. So again, it's an assessment of how, um, of evaluating how people use simulators and for example, using temporal cues such as the duration and speed of tissue deformation um, in visual perception of tissue elasticity. Um, subjects are able to discriminate elasticity. Um, their discrimination was either impaired or improved by removing or augmenting the temporal cues, for example. So this is one a scientific study on the, uh, the looking at the performance evaluation of using simulators. Um, in this project uh, by Dr. Daniel Keefe from University of Minnesota, um, he's using modeling and simulation in medical device design. And this particular project is, is, is very appropriate to what is being um, promoted in the MDIC um, in that if you look at a biopsy, a vacuum assisted biopsy device, um, and you want to design it, um, there's, so, there's a huge parameter space. And so the idea is that in the wheel plot here, um, this contains uh, all the parameters of the models that you want to manipulate. And then you have parameters for the physical 
uh, dimensions of the actual biopsy tool, but then you also have parameters for the tissue that you're cutting. And so the idea is to have this um, visualization tool for looking at um, hundreds of simulations of how to predict the outcomes of this particular tool in certain tissues with certain uh, parameters. So it's, it's really automating the process of, of design. So it, we actually had a webinar on this in our multi-scale modeling consortium, and it should be archived already, if not soon. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then our last project, Dr. Danny Bluestein from Stony Brook University, who I believe is on the call, contributed these slides from his NIBIB quantum grant project. And so um, I have the pleasure of meeting with Danny every month to look at his project for optimizing cardiovascular device thromboresistance for eliminating coagulants. And so the idea is Danny uses his aerospace background in developing, so to speak, wind tunnels for looking at these cardiovascular devices and how um, the platelets will activate within these devices. And so in this top simulation, he has approximately 30,000 platelets simulated um, as three micron diameter spheres seated in the upstream plane of the, um, the assist device, the ventricular assist device. And so he's using his computational models to optimize the design of these BADs, these ventricular assist devices, so that the platelets are, are less active and he uses these simulations to emulate the flow. And so I wanted to point out his pr project in particular because he also looks at these the, the actual um, surgical implantation procedures in which these BADs are implanted in the human body. And so um, he uses, he, so this is the actual VAD around the heart, and, and he describes where the VADs are reconnected to the aortic root through anastomosis. And so he actually simulates how the flow occurs in the aortic root. And so in this next slide, you see the um, implantation techniques of the VAD at different angles, and he looks at how the, um, the flow mixes between the, um, the implanted VADs and the aortic root. And so he's optimizing the connection of the VAD to the aortic root to, to look at the best mixing and swirling of the jet flow generated by the VAD and the blood flowing in the aortic root and optimizing the VAD inflow cannula curvature, the optimization of the radial orientation of the VAD, and also the inflow from the left ventricle. So in here you see uh, hopefully you see that implanting the VAD with a 60 degree anastomosis produced better thrombo resistance compared to the 90 degree um, anastomosis. So this is an example of how computational modeling can really affect how healthcare delivery occurs in terms of the surgical procedures for implanting these devices. So thank you for Dan to Danny for these slides, and I just wanted to promote that this, his project was uh, supported through the NIBIB quantum grant program, so you could say that his project is one of the medical moonshots of this program in which we believe could make a profound impact for healthcare delivery. So uh, a final slide is to let you know that we, do, we are holding a simulation research workshop at the NIH on June 10th of this year on the NIH campus. This particular workshop is focused on gastrointestinal and neurological care, but it really delves on a lot of simulation issues, um, not only in the technology development for simulation, but also in the performance and assessment, um, understanding why, for example, we have performance training for athletes, but yet we don't have performance training for uh, medical healthcare deliverers and, and things like that. So I would encourage you to go to the work website. If you can't find it, just do a search for NIH simulation gastrointestinal and this link will pull up. And finally, I want to also remind you to keep an eye out on the IMAG wiki. Do a search for IMAG wiki for our face-to-face -face, um, IMAG multi-scale modeling consortium meeting in late October or no, early November. So keep an eye out for that. 
So if you have any questions, this is my contact address. And I will show um, Dr. Dong's um, um, uh, simulation affinity group slide. So that concludes my talk, and I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wang, for your great presentation. Uh, we are very fortunate to have you here. Uh, I saw the text message, you know, Adriano, want to jump in, you know, if anything you want to add on? Please. Hi there, everybody. Um, greetings from the United Kingdom. Uh, it's getting quite late here, but it was good to be online. I'm grateful to uh, Grace for having shown a couple of slides from the VPH Institute and from the Avicenna Alliance. Um, uh, and uh, it was quite a lot for her to grab hold of all at once uh, since our webinar last week. But I think uh, she actually grabbed the essence of it. Um, what I would just point out, um, uh, the VPH Institute is a not-for-profit organization. It is a, it's academic uh, entirely. The Avicenna Alliance is industry-driven. Um, it will be very much um, in the first year at least focusing on uh, trying to influence policy development uh, in this area where policy currently doesn't really exist in some areas relating to modeling and simulation in healthcare. Um, embracing, for example, um, the emergence of wearable devices and the need uh, to undertake also hybrid um, uh, products which combine biopharmaceuticals and, and devices. Um, the alliance, I should just point out, is not just focusing on devices. It spans uh, pharmaceuticals, um, software, and uh, we will also be embracing uh, cosmetics. Essentially, any industry uh, that has a, an interest in having um, modeling and simulation at the core of its business model uh, in improving its product development and delivery to the patient and, indeed, assessment post-marketing in the real world, getting real-world evidence of the efficacy and take-up uh, of, of their products is incredibly important. So in a nutshell, that's what we're about. I don't want to keep anything else but uh, any, any, any uh, additional time. But if anybody has any questions, you've got the uh, uh, links to the website and emails, um, and I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions you may have. Great, Daniel. Thank you so much. I also saw um, Dr. Uh, Danny, right? Danny Plustin is online, if you can jump in, because I think uh, Grace introduced some of your project. You may can introduce a little bit yourself, your work, and how this applied to medicine in general. Uh, I, d I don't know the audience, you know, I think this is a lot of the audience is inside society, mostly society, similar to healthcare as educators for, um, you know, for, for training purpose, I think, of, Thank you for sharing the exciting capability of computer can doing things in medicine. Thank you. Danny, do you want to say something? So, so, so Grace, let, let me ask you a question first. You know, um, so thank you for those sharing the exciting examples. Um, what uh, uh, okay. Yeah, Danny, my, you're, you're, my you're, 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 you're on. Go ahead, Mike. Danny, you're on. We okay, can hear you. So, uh, what did you ask? Also, you want to share some of your experience, you know, to, to this group, you know, and the, how this, you know, um, working for, for, for the helping the healthcare, you know, in the big picture, because a lot of audience maybe is from social health, health, simulation healthcare, which are educators. Are we having a chance exposure to this kind of a simulation? And uh, yet, you know, that's we were try to create this forum to bring people together. Yeah. Uh, I guess, uh, uh, briefly, uh, in our simulations, uh, we first kind of uh, do optimization of devices, but at then uh, we actually were looking also how well this is implemented in actual clinical use. And in that, uh, we are working very closely with uh, cardiothoracic uh, surgeons for this case, for example, that uh, Grace 
uh, has presented of the ventricular assist devices. And the uh, uh, problem is that uh, you may optimize the device, but if it's not implanted uh, correctly, then you won't achieve this uh, optimized uh, performance, but uh, uh, you actually achieve this through the design uh, changes. So uh, Grace just uh, gave a couple of examples. Uh, we look at different uh, manifestations of uh, how it is uh, applied in the clinic. And we also do it uh, in other applications as well, not just in that, uh, like procedures, like for example, transcatheter, aortic valve replacement, etc., etc. So this has actually very uh, important uh, practical uh, clinical implications. So, uh, and in that, a uh, very important part of it is also to extract uh, data that is uh, patient specific, which is ex extracted from clinical modalities. So we do that as well. Uh, that, of course, uh, wasn't uh, presented here uh, because uh, this is beyond the scope. Uh, but uh, nowadays we're moving uh, uh, more and more towards precision uh, medicine that uh, also will be patient specific. Great, thank you so much. Um, and the I think uh, the reason which I try to bring this uh, community together is, you know, I see there's a huge opportunity for us. We talk across the traditional boundaries, you know, training, education, research, developments, you know, pharmaceuticals. Uh, in the computer, um, you know, uh, capability growing dramatically in the last couple of decades. Um, my particular interest, my research is more on the operational research side. You know, it's really help to improving healthcare processes, you know, workflow efficiency. And I think this is we show also see some opportunities. Uh, here I see uh, Robert. Uh, Robert, you know, oh, he's just left. There are another colleagues from another university. This is in the system engineering uh, colleagues. You know, there is a lot of concept actually bring from that community. So that's we try to bring people from different disciplines to to community. So, um, Chris, one challenge is a lot of things you talk about the technology is not familiar with with healthcare professionals. Uh, can you give some recommendations for how we can? Our partnership with engineers, computer scientists, you know, mathematicians to to moving this forward because sometimes we are in different campus, different places, seeing different languages, you know, costing differently. Any suggestions from your standpoint? Well, a lot of the initiatives that we're promoting now really are to try to incorporate the end users, and I would say the health healthcare professionals are one of the critical end users that should be incorporated as part of the research team. Um, we never want to develop technologies and modeling is a technology in a vacuum. And so having feedback from the healthcare professionals will be extremely important and useful um, if they're interested in participating. A lot of our initiatives are actually requiring that as part of the research team now. Okay. Yeah. Another, so, yeah. another well, avenue would be for them to participate in, in the grant review process and also coming to the workshops like the ones I showed you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think this is important because um, a lot of us you know, need to relearn and rewire our brain so to think differently uh, for those new technology. Uh, but I think the culture change have to happen before the, this really uh, broadly adopt this. Um, so I think this is the, the huge opportunities. Of course, there are the challenges. Uh, anybody from the audience you want to jump in? John? John yes. Rice, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I would just like to add, I don't know anything about any of this stuff a couple years ago. And and um, when I started to learn about it and got involved and met Grace and started going to the meetings, I really would encourage any of you who are interested to do that for, for the brilliance in the, in the community of people who are there. They are the warmest, most welcoming, tolerant of dumb questions um, group that I think I've ever tried to link with and, mm -hmm. and have made me very, very comfortable. <clears throat> and, and the mechanisms by which this kind of new science is going to actually impact on the lives of, of uh, people in this webinar that are in the clinical and healthcare side 
is going to depend on some of you, you know, going and dumping, jumping into the tough computational pond. You don't have to be a mathematician or a computer scientist. And, and Grace's um, suggestion that input is needed. Uh, I just want to encourage people who are interested to go ahead and, and go to one of their seminars or the SMS meeting and meet the people, and uh, you may discover a marvelous new life. Yeah. So to, to echo what you just said, because I learned a lot of new things. Because uh, in the early on, you know, Grace showed slides. You know, really is this user-centered design, you know, because we try to make new things, you know, and the uh, computer modeling, you know, really is a, is a really a platform really helping to improving time to market. Uh, I think in this the time of the uh, area, you know, it's very important to, 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 to be fast, to, uh, to, to fail fast, to fail cheap, to fail earlier, so we can have a more success at the end. So also I see AJ here, so actually he is from the industry. Um, so AJ, do you have some comments to want to say? Because uh, I think it's important that we have a partnership between academia, federal agency, industry, to, to work together as a um, community to work yeah. to go. Oh, AJ, please. Yeah. Um, so I have the opportunity of working with uh, one of the hospitals out here, and. Uh, and I come with a medical device background with modeling and simulation background. And what I have found is that the, uh, what I find it very surprising is that when uh, medical devices or different processes that are in integrated into the hospital side, that uh, the practical application of it is not seen from the viewpoint of what the physician needs or what the nurses need. Uh, so I'm still learning. But I think this is a very valuable or, or, or the right place to focus also is within the hospital, what is needed by the hospitals, by the physician to do their job right. And typically what I've seen is the devices are given to them saying, use it. And I'm surprised that there are no requirements coming back from physicians or from nurse saying, no, we don't like this piece or we want this particular aspect that really helps us in, in helping out the, the patient. So, and modeling and simulation can help, can help in some of these things. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, for this society, we have uh, 3,000 more uh, clinicians on first-line providers. You know, I think this is a good opportunity uh, for, for, for you to interact with different disciplines, different specialties, you know. Uh, they are very open-minded to try to new things. I think, uh, please join us. Uh, the reason we create this group is just for this purpose, try to bridge, you know, different community, different groups, you know, how to, uh, under the same uh, simulation modeling framework, how to improve in different aspect of the system, of the systems. So thank you so much for your participation. Grace, did you want to put in a plug for Mark Garby's co-sign meeting in late May? Um, sure. Well, so Mark Garby is involved in, um, virtual clinical simulation models, and he actually helped organize the Multiscale Modeling Consortium meeting last year, so there is a focus on that. And if you go to the IMAG wiki, you'll see the information for his meeting. Uh, so last year it was at the NIH, this year I believe is in Bordeaux. Did you want to chime in and provide some more details on the agenda? Well, Grace, can you, can you go to your browser to, to, to bring that website if we have convenient for you? To bring what? So the, the, the website you're talking about. Yeah, go, can oh, go to sure. your browser. That's fine. So, yeah, yeah, so I think this is a good opportunity. So I think we should have this, you know, kind of common um, interest places to look at this information um, across different uh, agencies, groups. Um, <laughs> So this is the IMAG wiki. Like I said, if you search IMAG space wiki, you'll find it. And if and like like today's webinar is posted here, we also have funding opportunities. If you go to more, we have a lot more funding opportunities listed uh, for biomedical, biological, behavioral, computing interests. Um, in terms of IMAG events, you can find the 2015 meeting here, where we have the final agenda here. And we actually have an, 
like the everything, all the discussions were, are actually posted here on the the wiki. Um, so um, you know, we had a, a special discussion on um, medical simulator simulators and training trainers here. And so you'll see, for example, Iwana's presentation here. Um, I don't know if we have her presentation here, but so, so some of them have posted their presentations. So we also recap the COSINE 5 meeting, which was brought up. So this was the fifth international conference on computational surgery and, and dual training, and the scientific program is here, uh, where you can see um, the, the idea of Mark's conference really is to bring together the clinicians with the modelers to talk about simulations in the clinical environment. And so I believe if you, if I believe Cosine is already um, posted on the IMAG wiki. So if we go there, um, under relevant MSM meetings, we usually post it in reverse chronological order of what's happening first. So let's see here. This is a test of our wiki. Um, I don't see it right here. But if you go to cosine six, I believe, uh, I think it's computationalsurgery.org. Right. So I believe this. No, this yeah, that's it. That's it. So May twenty sixth in the University of Bordeaux. Um, like I said, is, is there anything else you wanted to see here? We, we Again, we try to archive our webinars. We do have our working groups. So in order to join the consortium, there's multiple ways you can join. You can join as a full-fledged member with one of your multi-scale modeling projects, or you can join as a friend, or you can join any of the working groups. There's no requirements for joining the, the working groups. And the working groups have their own participant list, for example. Um, so I would encourage you to participate. Yeah. So great. So so thank you so much, Grace, for for your uh, this uh, presentation. We are grateful for this opportunity to learn from you and your groups. And uh, I'm I'm looking forward to the uh, other opportunities to to work together. So and hope this will be an ongoing basis for communication across boundaries, you know, for the um, different interests. So again, so and also, if anybody have any questions, please ask. Well, thank you, Yue. This was a great um, experience and opportunity, and I do hope that um, the field the field will continue to move forward. Sure. So each of you will re receive a, a email for the survey, so we will have to hear your feedback. And also, please consider join this affinity group. And again, this affinity group in the link, which Grace showed earlier, also will be in the archive and um, with the email I sent to you. And um, so thank you so much again. We are looking forward to see you soon. We will have another session in summer, a couple other sessions inviting for um, professor from UK to presenting other aspects of the computer simulation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley, for helping to organize this meeting. Thank you, Ashley. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. That was good. Thank you.